SpaceX has revealed that mobile Starlink is coming to boats and RVs, but we've got a reality check letting you know what to really expect. Hi, I'm Chris with the Mobile Internet Resource Center here to give you an exciting update on Starlink. This is SpaceX's massive um, satellite internet constellation that is currently being deployed in the skies above us with well over a thousand satellites uh, currently in orbit and well you know, I think just in the next five days 120 more going up and more and more and more. Starlink is a big deal that does have the potential to revolutionize communication across the planet particularly in unserved and underserved areas where there is not really great access to fast broadband internet speeds. Now, now the big question for Starlink is well what about people who are mobile who don't have a fixed address who are moving about the country around the world traveling in boats and rvs a lot of us have been dreaming about a next generation satellite in internet constellation um, satellite broadband and well, is is starlink going to support us well yes they are they've been saying since the beginning that starlink is intended for supporting mobile installations but up until now spacex has not really shared any of the details about what that might look like and well, over this past weekend, they have finally shared a tiny tidbit of information. Now, what has happened is a SpaceX filed with the FCC, uh, this is the Federal Communications Commission, asking for permission to start deploying Starlink service on to vessels, you know, um, boats, vehicles, and aircraft. Um, they need to get FCC licensing permission before they're allowed to actually start bringing out service to market serving mobile users. And this is a big blanket license request asking for you know, basically unlimited permission to do this throughout the United States on international waters and anywhere else that the U.S. would have jurisdiction. So, wow, big, big news. You know, SpaceX is finally taking this step towards mobility and getting people even more excited. Elon Musk even tweeted out saying that this was intended for RVs. So, wow, people are exploding with excitement thinking this is, they can take their Starlink service, sign up, and go anywhere. And, well, we need to give you a little bit of reality check around what Starlink and mobility actually means. And first off, let's take a look at the current mobility limitations of the current Starlink system that is being sold for, you know, rural residential customers, mostly in the northern half of North America right now. Now, there's been a lot of confusion about just what is up with uh, how Starlink supports taking these systems and can you move them or are they tied to your official service address? And well, SpaceX has been pretty clear in the Starlink FAQ from the beginning saying that uh, there is no arbitrary geofencing, but they explain that your Starlink is, any Starlink service is assigned to a cell, just like a cell tower would be. You're assigned to a kind of an area of the map and your service is assigned to just a single cell, and the satellite will basically ignore you if you are out of that cell. So this means that there's, well, not technically any arbitrary geofencing that says, enforces that you are at your home address. It does mean that as you travel um, further and further from your home address, you might come to the edge of a cell, pass into another cell, and the satellite will be no longer paying any attention to you, your service will drop off to nothing. And there have been plenty of reports online of people taking their Starlink you know, receiver, throwing it in the trunk, and setting it up in various places around their house and getting excited. It's like, hey, I'm 15 miles away. I'm even 20 miles away and still getting connected. But once you get much further than that, there's a lot of reports of, well, you know, the Starlink service will drop off, as SpaceX says, when you leave that cell behind. So Starlink as it stands now, the residential service is not mobile friendly. But what you can do is, well, you can contact Starlink support, they do it via email and say, hey, here's my new service address. So if you're moving to a your remote cabin or moving to a new state or moving to someplace else, you can send them an email and two or three days later, they will respond saying, hey, great, we have service in your new area. We have coverage there. We have changed your address. Your Starlink system will now no longer work at your original address, will work at the new address. That's how Starlink mobility works right now. It's a little bit awkward, not really conducive to frequent travelers because having a two to three day wait while you hop around the country to every time you change locations, just not gonna cut it. Now, what Starlink has told some people in via customer support uh, emails is that they are working on a self-serve portal 
So, then. so now once SpaceX puts in either this uh, um, self-serve address change process or maybe the satellite just gets smart enough to auto change and reassign you to a cell automatically, um, the current residential Starlink service becomes relocatable and you can, you know, throw it in a trunk, throw it in an RV bay, take it someplace else and set it up pretty easy. And that will satisfy the needs for a lot of people, particularly RVers. But now this current system is not designed to be used in motion, which means even the gentle motion of a boat or certainly the motion of an RV driving, not, not, not in the scope of the current generation of this residential Starlink order. If you want true mobility, if you want to be able to mount something on a boat or an RV that is moving, that is a whole nother ball game. And well, SpaceX is planning on doing that as well. So now the, the specific quote that got people excited from Elon Musk was actually him pointing out that uh, raining on the parade for all the Tesla fans who were dreaming of Starlink in their Teslas. And he was like, no, connecting Tesla cars to Starlink as our, is not going to happen because the Starlink terminal is much too big. There's really no way to shrink down with current technology, the big phased array, dishy McFlat face antenna that uh, is required for Starlink. So you've got an 18 inch big giant pizza that needs to be roughly aimed in North America towards the northern sky. That's not going to work on top of a sedan driving down the highway at 80 miles an hour. But, well, you can put that into a dome and put it on top of an RV and add a little bit more advanced robotics to track the motion, you know, better handle uh, vehicle in motion, and suddenly you've got Starlink that works while underway. Same sort of robotics could work in a boat and other things as well. So electronically, it's not really a big deal to take the current Starlink stuff, add better mechanicals to it, and make it mobile. And in fact, SpaceX's FCC filing says that the future mobile Starlink systems will be electrically identical, the same exact dish as what they're already using for residential. It's just all the packaging, the mechanical bits, and everything else will be different. So this means that the uh, Starlink receivers will, you know, certainly not cost the same $4.99 as the residential market receivers. They will potentially look significantly different, be encapsulated for weather, better set up for aiming and motion. And well, you know, in the uh, FCC filing, SpaceX says that these things will be required to be professionally installed and they will have to ensure that they will be installed in a way that works to match their license. So Stuff is coming, but now don't think you could take your residential Starlink dish you could sign up for today and make that mobile. And now then, of course, there is the other big concern with mobility that you know, a lot of the places you want to go, particularly with an RV, have a thing called trees that go up into the sky, might be surrounding you. You might want to park in the shade just because it keeps you cool. And well, trees and satellite internet, particularly Starlink, do not go well together. So as the satellites are going through the sky, they might be going across the horizon here, going this way, going that way. If they pass behind a tree, that is a drop in your connection. And um, well, for some things you do online, maybe a few second drop here and there, or a minute off here, or a minute off there, not a big deal. But if you're living a Zoom lifestyle and working online, doing a lot of video work or interactive work, having constant dropouts means Parking your RV in the forest is not going to be a good idea. Now, SpaceX can get better with this with smarter software in the future, and potentially the Starlink um, dishes will gain the ability to track multiple satellites. So as long as at least one satellite is not behind a tree, you can still get coverage, but it is still going to be a challenge um, taking Starlink on an RV to a lot of the places that a lot of us like to go. Um, on a boat, that's a little bit less of a concern because, well, there tends not to be obstructions around you other than your own mast that might occasionally interfere. But there is a different concern for um, cruisers who want to put Starlink on a boat. And some people are excited, like, wow, at last we can get you know fast broadband internet, hopefully affordably, while crossing oceans, places where it has really never been practical to get online at broadband speeds. And well, there is a catch, and we've covered this in prior videos before, is that the current Starlink constellation, the first generation of satellites, um, relies on ground stations. So any person communicating to Starlink, your signal's going up to the satellite and bouncing down to a ground station. And if there is 
no ground station in range of you and the satellite above you, you have no Starlink coverage. The satellite has nothing to talk to. In the future, Starlink satellites will actually have laser interconnects. So if there's no ground station in range, it'll just ping pong and hop the, hop the connection across the sky via laser from one Starlink satellite to another, to maybe another, until a ground station is in range. And then you'll have coverage anywhere on the globe. But again, the first generation of Starlink satellites up here do not physically have the lasers. This is something that uh, SpaceX has said will start with the Starlinks launching in 2022, next year. And then, well, the current constellation will have to, you know, basically, they'll have to get enough of the laser-equipped satellites up there to provide oceanic coverage before you'll really be able to cruise super far from shore um, and stay connected with Starlink. But good news is ground stations do have a pretty substantial coverage of hundreds of miles. And so even just like a few ground stations on key islands in the Caribbean and along the coast of the U.S. will cover most of the places most North American cruisers are likely to go. It's the oceanic folks are going to have to wait a while before they're going to be streaming Netflix while, you know, biding time crossing the Pacific. Now, one other thing, that, you know, SpaceX has made this $99 a month price plan for currently unlimited internet data kind of their price. And they've said that they're going to try and match this price depending on, you know, local taxes and fees and regulations. But that's their basic target price as they roll Starlink out to residential service around the world. Now, that is because they're competing for, you know, competing with incumbent cable companies and existing ISPs and all this such sorts of things. When they take Starlink Mobile, they're competing in a diff completely different market, and there is no guarantee that that $99 a month unlimited price plan will be what becomes the Starlink Mobile plan. So don't necessarily assume that the plans you see today will be the mobile plans, um, particularly when they're you know targeting some of the marine markets where right now data is priced at absolutely insane levels, you know, sometimes over a thousand dollars a gigabyte, you know, they sell, sell data by the kilobits per second and stuff. SpaceX has got a lot of room to really undercut their uh, um, current satellite competitors and, well, potentially sell data plans that are not quite that $99 extreme value. So we will have to wait and see um, just what the hardware is going to look like, what the data plans are going to look like, and all of that. So then the question is, well, okay, they filed the paperwork with the FCC. When? When is this going to happen? When When can we give SpaceX our money and have this universal connectivity? It's going to take a while. You know, this paperwork is just the start of a process. Uh, SpaceX has requested that the FCC move expeditiously, but there is now the opportunity for other concerned parties and competitors to file objections with the FCC, to pose technical concerns about potentials for interference or other issues with how the satellites will interact with each other in the sky or other services on the ground. And this is a, the beginning of a long back and forth bureaucratic process that at the absolute best case can take you know, many months and potentially could take years before SpaceX gets granted a license to bring out their mobile service. And we're probably not going to hear the specific details of what the next generation, the mobile hardware will look like, what the plans will look like, what any of this is, until the license details are worked out, the license is signed, and SpaceX is ready to go. So you can, this is not something, we've seen some people think they're going to be jumping on this um, almost immediately. It is not something you can jump on just yet. It is exciting. It is very exciting to track. Never underestimate how fast SpaceX moves. They've been ramping up Starlink at an incredible pace. They've recently actually even begun experimenting with like a double speed mode, taking their advertised 150 megabits per second speed. Now we're seeing some people in the beta program reporting 300 and 400 megabits per second speeds. They're rolling this stuff out, this technology out so fast. They're expanding their coverage for further south, and by the end of the year, they'll have all of North America covered for sure. Um, but again, this stuff does take time. Exciting. Keep tracking it. We'll keep covering it here, and we will keep pointing out the, the realities and the things that are legitimately exciting as Starlink rolls out to, well, to the world. These videos are brought to you by our premium members, our mobile internet aficionados. They make it possible for us to track this news and create these videos. If you like this video, 
please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel, or better yet, consider becoming a member yourself.